If you would, open your Bibles to, and we're going to study two particular passages this afternoon. And to Bible students, none of these will be, or either one of them will be foreign to you. But turn with me to Luke 16, first of all. Luke 16, beginning in verse 19. Luke 16, beginning with verse 19. And you might mark there also 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll go to that in just a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Of course, in Luke 16, our Lord is giving us this instruction. We often wonder and questions are asked, and there's so much we can know. And so much it's not revealed for us to know. But our Lord speaks and he says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Who is this man? Well, he's called a rich man. And he wears that clothing that is significant, a sign of, those who are wealthy. The purple that's mentioned here and the fine linen, you had to be quite wealthy in the days of the ancients to be able to own that. And that's just sort of saying how rich is he? He's rich enough to wear these clothes. And notice that he fares sumptuously every day. Well, now mark this and keep in mind as we go down through here what he said in verse 1 as you describe the rich man. Let's note this first. Everything said in verse 19 about this man, this rich man, within and of itself is not necessarily wrong. You can read in the Old Testament of Abraham, and for his day, he was a very wealthy person. You can see Isaac, and you'll see he's a very wealthy person. Jacob, same way. You see also that when it comes to Joseph, through much adventures and heartache, he's elevated to be second in power and rule when it comes only to Pharaoh. So those things within themselves are not necessarily wrong. So we have to look to something else. He turns from this rich man and he begins to describe another man. Now let me pause here and say this. Please keep in mind this is Jesus giving this in his earthly ministry. He's talking to Jews. They're still approaching God faithfully under the law of Moses. That's important to understand for matters that are said a little later. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. How bad off is he? Well, it's just, you know, he's a beggar. That's bad enough. But somebody else has to put him at the gate of the rich man. Desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Well, to say the least, the poor fellow's in terrible shape. Keep in mind that this is not a parable. Some have taught that it was. The Jove's witnesses, in trying to get around, these two, after they died, because Jehovah's Witnesses do not teach that there is a spirit within you. They do not believe in what's about to be described here, where these two men go after they die. They don't believe that. So they try to say it's a parable and discredit really what Jesus is saying. Well, if it's a parable, it doesn't work like a parable in the sense of the way it's worded. The way it's worded. Notice. There was a certain rich man. Now, let me ask you a question. Was there? There was. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Was there? Yes, there was. That's the way the ancients in recording history or events of the time wrote. And that's a very plain statement. And all you have to do is ask the question, was there after the declaration Christ makes and names the two men? describing how they lived in contrast one to another. So we then drop and notice the beggar dying. 
and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Well, that's not that significant to us from the standpoint of the words that are used here. In the church, we've heard the Bible preached. Now, this is very familiar to us because many of us have heard this explained. But that's peculiar to Jesus speaking to Jews. They thought the ultimate in paradise was, was to be in the bosom of Abraham. Very close to Abraham. If you could get that close to Abraham after death, then you were in paradise. Now, came to pass, beggar died and was carried by the angels. Angels are spirit beings. I see no reason, and might mark this down as something to give hope to every faithful child of God who's dying. This is what Jesus said happens at the point of death. And he mentions it as it relates to a man who is in terrible condition in this world. So he dies. What happens at the moment that his spirit leaves this body? And James says that the body apart from the spirit is dead. I believe firmly that this teaches us a great hope and comfort that God's children, that's how special they are, when they die, have an escort of angels to take them into paradise. Now, if you say, well, how do you know that? Well, do you think this is the only time this ever happened to anybody that's considered saved? That's the only time they ever happened. No, I don't believe so. This is to help those who read it and their facing of death. Okay. So the beggar comes to represent a person who dies saved from sin. But then the rich man also died and was buried. And the King James reads, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Well, the Greek word translated hell is Hades. But in the King James Version time, hell carried a more general definition than it carries today. To us today, hell means the final abode of the wicked after the day of judgment. The lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But Hades carries with it the idea of the place of departed spirits. That's in complete harmony with what happens here because the man's spirit leaves and angels escort him into what's called Abraham's bosom. But this man goes into this place and it's a place of torments. And he sees Abraham. Mind you, he doesn't see it with the physical eye. But he knows Abraham, but Abraham died hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before this man lived. How did he recognize him? Obviously, there's a recognition that's beyond the human eye in being able to identify people. So he sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Well, you'll remember that when Jesus died, the thief asked him, to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. Jesus responds by saying, Verily I say unto thee today, Shalt thou be with me in paradise. Those spirits of the thief and of Jesus went to the same place that the rich man went and Lazarus went. But we see a division of Hades. And let's read further. The rich man cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. I know that when a man dies outside of Christ, guilty of his sins, or else a member of the church is overtaken in a trespass and will not repent of his sins, when they die, this, a moment later, is where they're going to be. How do I know that? Because Jesus said so. And Jesus knows. So how tormented is he that he may dip the tip of his finger? That's Lazarus. Now this man would have nothing to do with Lazarus. Laid at his gate full of sores, desiring the crumbs that fell from his table in this life. But now he says, send him over here with his finger dipped in water and touch it to my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. Oh, but he's in the spirit world, a metaphysical world. There's nothing material. How can there be fire? I am always amazed at the people who don't understand the power of God. 
If God could speak material things into existence, then he can speak anything into existence to fit the world that he intended to be in. And we learn already from Jesus' teaching that there's a place prepared for the devil and his angels. If you choose to be rebellious to God, to do your own thing here, then when you leave this life, you go to the place prepared for you. Now, if you're faithful and you've loved the Lord with your whole heart, you've loved your neighbor and yourself, you've been obedient to him, Revelation 2.10, then you're going to be with Lazarus at Abraham's bosom. Paradise. Place of departed spirits, waiting the end of the world and the day of judgment. But if you have lived as did the rich man, who he did not take, that is, he had no interest, take any interest in Lazarus. He didn't abide by the law of Moses concerning such a one. He didn't use his wealth to help that person who could not help himself. Remember, I say again, this is given to Jews who are under the law. This is not given under the gospel system. This is Jesus speaking to Jews telling this story. But the truth of where a man goes and why he goes there is taught in this story. So there is a if you want to call it this, intermediate state. A place to take care of those who die and their spirits leave this, their bodies while the earth continues on. Now notice what we have. He's still a self-centered man. He wants himself taken care of. He doesn't realize that you're here because you died a sinner. You died living contrary to the law of Moses. You died doing your own thing and caring for yourself. Now, if there ever was a me, 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 self-willed person, this is that man. You sought after the material things, while a man who could not help himself, had nobody to take care of him, was right at your gate, and you wouldn't do it. So, Abraham responds in verse 25. Abraham said, Son, remember. Son, remember. We take our memories with us. We'll be able to remember what we did here on this earth. And Abraham says, you need to do that right now. Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he's comforted, and thou art tormented. I know that Abraham's bosom, paradise, is a place of comfort. Comfort in what sense? Well, here we labor and toil as we look for a home. Just a humble abode among men. Here we fight the fight of faith. Here we determine to bring our every thought and subjection to Jesus Christ as is presented in the Word of God. Here we resist temptation. Here we battle sin. Here we do all those things. It's a constant effort. Not mentioning the things that are peculiar to this world that all men undergo in living in the flesh. That seems to be just a part of us that we don't even think of. We're relieved of that at death. All that's gone. So we're able to see there is a comfort that I don't think any human mind can begin to grasp as to what lies ahead for those who die in the faith. But he's speaking to this rich man in this place of torment, suffering. Who knows he's suffering? But he carries on a logical conversation. And you're going to see the division there in the Hadean world, the place for those who die lost and the place for those who die innocent or saved from their sins. Abraham says to them, And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. Now, who fixed that great gulf in the Hadean world? Why, it's God. No man could do this. And it's set there for a purpose, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. They can't do it. There's a lot of people in this world who think themselves so bold and they're so self-willed and so trusting in themselves. Well, when I get there and I'll do this and I'll do this, nobody's going to, I'll just march through those gates. There's nobody, that's what they've done here, at least tied all their life. But notice they can't do it. Before the end of the world or the day of judgment and the resurrection, this is what happened to a man the moment he dies. If he's saved or innocent, we see where he goes. The paradise, the bosom of Abraham. He's comforted. He's relieved of all this life has to offer, especially those who live godly in Christ Jesus, for they shall always suffer persecution. So they can't, 
They can't cross over. In effect, Abraham's saying, if I wanted to send him over there, I couldn't do it. And if you wanted to come over here, and no doubt he may have, since he's pleading with Abraham to send Lazarus over with his finger dipped in water that he may touch it to his tongue, for he is tormented in this flame. But he said, that won't work either. It's fixed. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. Now we know that this is a place of departed spirits while the world is still here. This rich man who's lost has five brethren back on this earth living just like he was living before he died. And he recognizes in his state of torment as a spirit in the metaphysical or spiritual realm that his brethren are still where they could repent. They're still in this life. They're still in this world. They're still in a fleshly body. Notice, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them. Who? Lazarus. Lest they also come into this place. That is a place. It's a spiritual place. That is, it's not material. But it's a place nevertheless. A place for People, when they die, while the world still goes on, headed for the end of the world, Christ's second coming and the judgment. So this man doesn't want his brethren to come there. But now let's see what kind of character, and you've heard me say this before, this fellow has. Abraham saith unto him, they, your five brethren, you think you're so concerned about, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. In other words, they have the word of God for their time. They can turn by following the Word of God in repentance and start living like the law of Moses said, and they won't have to come here, just like Lazarus went to the place that he assigned himself by his living as he lived. Now, and he said no. Now the true character of this man comes out. Here he is suffering because he lived a rebellious, self-centered, sinful life. He's pleading that Abraham, he recognizes and knows who he is, send Lazarus over. All Lazarus ever was to him was something he'd use. Most of the time that was neglecting. But he still has that disposition of heart. He took it with him. And so, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Well, may I remind you that he who gives us this account would die and rise from the dead to rise no more. And how many in the world today believe his gospel? He said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. A lot of folks think if they could just see miracles like Jesus worked or the apostles worked, well, that would, just, that would be all there was to it. But notice that Abraham puts the focus on the word of God for the Jewish dispensation as the authority for them to appeal to and live by. Because he simply says, if they won't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded. Persuaded. Paul says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Well, have you ever tried to persuade people whose will is not to be persuaded? Can't do it. Deliver me from unreasonable men. We're logical people. God made us that way, but if we choose to be illogical, unreasonable we certainly can because we have free moral agency we certainly can and frankly most people choose to be that way to one extent or the other the bible makes it clear that most people who ever live in this life are going to lose their soul straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it well god wants everybody to be saved christ died for everybody then why aren't all saved because I said this morning, because of the free will we have, and most of us want to do as we please, or at least attempt to, even when it comes down to setting aside the Word of God. Now, so we learn then that you can't set the Bible aside. You can't set the authority of God's Word. Let's apply that to now. That age is ended, 1,500 years. The Jews approached God through the law of Moses. But at the cross, Galatians 2.14, the law ended. Now we're under authority of Christ. All authority hath been given unto me in heaven on earth, Jesus said. Matthew 28, 18. That authority is manifest in the rightly divided word of his last will and testament. John 12, 48 says we'll be judged according to his words. So what am I to expect when I die? Well, I'm going to expect to go to one of these two places. You don't have any more choices. That is, if you study the Bible. And when you die, it, it, you won't make the choice. 
you made that choice according to your attitude toward God and His Word today. That's the reason today's the day of salvation. And now is the accepted time. So this tells us that God has taken care of things. Even when men die today, whether they be faithful or unfaithful or never obey the gospel, as to their spirits awaiting the day of resurrection, awaiting the day to enter before the judgment. Well, then what is the judgment? This man, the rich man, is already being punished. What, what is this business of the judgment? The Bible talks about we will be rewarded according to our works. Now, if you will, go with me. And hold all that in your mind to our passage in 2 Corinthians 5. Paul, of course, is talking here to Christians. And he's making it very clear that he looks beyond the place of departed spirits. We just read about the place of departed spirits. Lost spirits, because they sinned and died and sinned here. Or saved spirits. They were innocent, died as babies, not accountable to God, or else died faithful. But when you come down to his writings of the church at Corinth in the second letter, chapter 5, notice what he said that we know. I like Scripture all through because it's God's Word. But I like these statements that says, for we know. That's a solid foundation. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved. Now watch how he jumps all the way past the Hadean world. And he's speaking to Christians. This is even more hope granted to the faithful. Notice he says, we have a building of God, and we have a resurrected body. Remember John said, we do not know what we shall be like, but we shall be like Him. So we have a building of God, not a house not made with hands. It's not fleshly. It's not material. And it's eternal in the heavens. So Paul looks beyond the place of departed spirits to the resurrection. This is meant to comfort Christians and keep them faithful. This is meant to strengthen them when they're undergoing all manner of persecution for Christ's sake. So he says, what do we have waiting out there beyond the place that now stands as we just studied about Luke 16? Well, we have an eternal abode made to fit that world, even as this fleshly body is made to fit this world. What about this body? For in this we groan, earnestly designed to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. There's something wrong with a person who says, I'm a Christian, and is not desiring with all their being to have a resurrected body, to be glorified and walk in the presence of God, leaving this old world and all the wicked people behind. Now notice, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Paul describes the state that we just studied about, the place of departed spirits. Without a body, he calls it naked. That tells me a lot, and we don't have time to go into all of it, but it tells me God intended the human spirit to be in a body. And Paul looks beyond the naked state of the spirit alone and looks to when he's going to be back in a body. But what kind of body would it be? Well, it's not one that's burdened by this fleshly body with disease and age and time-bound and material-bound and going to return to the dust from which he came. But it's going to be that eternal body like the Lord has. Notice what is this situation for we that are in this tabernacle. Let me pause here and point out. Tabernacles from the Greek word skene, and it means a temporary dwelling place. It means a tent. Paul is contrasting this physical body that must return to the dust from which it was made to the eternal body when our spirits are raised in that we will never leave. It's eternal life. The second death are those in hell. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. Why? Well, we're burdened. Not that we would be unclothed. That's not what God intended for the Spirit. But clothed upon that what? That mortality might be swallowed up of life. Eternal life is not duration. For hell has unending duration. But when you say eternal life, you mean the quality of the life in the resurrected body like Christ now has in heaven in the presence of God. While that quality is so high above and beyond us, we can't begin to understand it with our finite minds. Now look what he says, verse 5. Now he that hath wrought us, made us, for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. 
Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. But faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Whether we walk by faith and not by sight, and faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, then we walk as the Word of God leads, guides, and directs us, and we do not let the affairs around us move us away from what we know the Bible teaches. Well, I find great comfort in that. We don't have to depend upon what people think about us from the standpoint of letting that move us away from doing what we know God said one ought to do. So he says we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body where Lazarus was and Abraham and to be present with the Lord. There's a sense that when we leave this world because we're comforted and when we die innocent or saved that we're in a closer relationship with our Lord. So, and to be present with the Lord. But the greatest and closest intimacy of the child of God with Christ comes in the resurrection when we actually possess a body glorified as Christ's body is glorified and we walk the streets of gold as it were even in heaven. Now notice his attitude. Remember what we say about therefore, hence, so, wherefore? Verse 9, wherefore we labor Wherefore, in the light of these truths, in the light of what is in store for the faithful, in the light of those who die faithful, what's waiting for them, then we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Now notice how he winds this all up. Verse 10. For we must. There's no escaping this. It's a must. Nobody's going to escape it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or evil. Now, I said earlier that when you leave that Hadean world, you're leaving it to come before the judgment, and thus the world is gone. The elements have melted with fervent heat, and the earth also, the works of therein, shall be burned up. So there is the resurrection of damnation, and there is the resurrection unto life. Those who die lost are raised to damnation. You know, do this sometime in your studies. Notice in the New Testament when the resurrection is discussed in detail, it reveals to us what happens to the faithful when they die. But little is said in detail about the state of the resurrected damned, except that they are just that. In the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether good or bad. Now that tells us the difference if you've got Lazarus comforted in paradise, and you've got a great gulf, and then over here you've got the rich man tormented in that fire. But yet you have the rewards offered at the judgment after the resurrection. That tells me that there can't be a perfect judgment since God is perfectly just, knowing all that's knowable until the place of your works and the influence of them for good or bad is over and done with. Now, when's that going to be? When this world ends. Then you can be judged because all that you've done, whether good or bad, is finished. And all the influence for good or bad you've left on this earth is over and done with. There's no more place for it. So, you come before the Lord. He separates the goats, the lost, on his left hand, and the sheep, the saved, on his right. And in general, he declares to the left hand, Depart from me, I never knew you. And to those on his right, come, you blessed of my Father. Here at the kingdom prepared for you for the world was. Do you see the process? You leave completely our state of affairs here in place of existence, governed by time and space as we know it. And you enter a place that is a realm for Christians who are faithful to where there's great comfort. You're relieved of all of this. But the ultimate is at the judgment when as one of the sheep on his right hand in a resurrected body like Christ now possesses, you're ushered into glory forevermore. 
and you're rewarded according to your works. Thus, they must be faithful works or you wouldn't be in heaven. Or if you're lost, God's going to still deal with you justly. And he's going to mete out your works according to your state also. Now, there's a lot we don't know because it's not revealed. And we can only know what is revealed. But if it's revealed in God's word, it's good for us. It strengthens us. It lifts us up. It keeps us going. And it causes us to look beyond this veil of tears and heartache and hurt and mean things. And we see the happy, peaceful home of the soul. Far beyond the tempter's snare. But there's no possibility of sin. And all is done just exactly as God wants it. In the city, four square. I hope this is encouraging to the faithful. I hope it gives boldness to those who know the truth. And will, they'll buy it and sell it not. And that they will live by it, let come what may. If you need to obey the gospel, then in order to go to the place of the soul that the Lord wants us to go, whether it's when he comes back, we go directly at the end of time as we're changed, the moment, the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, or whether we die, we enter into the place of departed spirits. We want to be sure we go to where Lazarus went, where Abraham went, where Jesus went, where the thief went, where all those who are innocent or saved go. You'll be there what you made yourself to be here. You'll die either a rebel against God or you'll die faithful, desiring to be as close to God as you can and you've lived all your life doing His will. But you begin by believing with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being buried with your Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. Now, as a child of God, why would we drift off like that old rich man did and forget what we're here for? Why would we let anybody move us away from that? No, we know where we stand. We know why we are doing what we're doing because we can read and understand the Bible. Somebody says, how do you know that? I can read and understand my mother tongue. And I can even study a little harder and understand the words the Lord actually gave the New Testament in. And I can receive great comfort. Remember, for we walk by faith and not by sight. But that's sufficient to get us from here to the place, in all honesty, if we are, we want to be there. If you're subject to the Lord's grand invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.